who said that civilization advances when we extend the number of important operations we perform without thinking about them. And we, we like to we like to share this because to us, a lot of what we do is, is rooted in creating abstraction layers, specifically at the database level. And when we think about what's the purpose of creating abstraction layers specifically to the world, it literally means we push forward as, as a civilization by building technology that pushes forward us as a humanity, whether that's, you know, going to, um, going to, uh, you know, SpaceX or, or perhaps something more mundane, like, uh, like a, like a dating app, for example. Now, but specifically for us at Graken, the, the fields that inspired us to do what we do are, are very much rooted in knowledge representation and automated reasoning. Um, and, and that's, a, for those unfamiliar, that's a subfield within symbolic artificial intelligence, also referred to as the classical AI stuff. And for those unfamiliar with knowledge representation, effectively, it's a system to encode domain knowledge consistently for logical interpretation, potentially by a computer. And so, what we effectively want to be doing is we want to model if we've got something like a mammal and we have subtypes of those mammals we may have humans we may have cats and we may then create instances of those types uh, alice can be a human and if we create those instances we can then create certain conclusions from those so we can say that if alice is an instance of a human given that a human is a subset of a mammal we can also now say that alice is therefore a mammal and 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 when it comes to automated reasoning, we think of a system to derive logical conclusions from two or more propositions that are believed to be true. And, and, and here effectively in the example that we're, we're showing, if we, if we say, if we know that man is a subtype of a mortal, and we also know that Socrates is, is an instance of a man, given those two propositions, we can therefore conclude, logically conclude that Socrates is mortal as well. And so, you know, at, at least for us, you know, studying this, especially in, in, in theory when we're at university, um, may lead us to look at some beautiful math. Um, but the actual practical applicability, when at least when we look at the world, um, or specifically when we started Graken, um, is very much rooted in, in logistical systems. So when we think about, you know, getting a product to a destination, just modeling all the constraints that, that are involved in doing that, we have different employees, that their availabilities, the delivery methods, the, um, uh, the, the warehouses, the damages, the returns, the shifts, all of that modeling that in traditional database systems becomes extremely complex. And it's not uncommon for us to write SQL queries that end up looking like this. And, and so this, this complexity inherent, um, we see in, in a, in a in, in, a, in a few different things. So what makes data complex? So we, we talk about complex data when there's a lot of different type hierarchies and it's not just entity type hierarchies, but also relation type hierarchies. I already briefly pointed out to those entity type hierarchies, but effectively we're looking at if a human is a subtype of a mammal, then a mammal is also a subtype of an animal. And we can have relation type hierarchies where we've got a type of employment relation, but we may also create temporary employment or permanent employments. And then we have a lot of different types of relations as well. Unary relations, binary relations. We may have ternary, enary relations, infinitary relations. We may have nested relations, equivalent relations. In, in, in short, there's a lot of different types of relations that we, that we have to, that we come across. And then the second part is what makes it so challenging to query these, these networks of, of data. So if we have an example um, model where we're trying to get a, uh, a, a company delivering something to a destination, um, if, if, we, if we ask a question in such a logistical system, for example, which organizations have premises in the UK, asking a question like that where, where only part of the data may be persisted and some other parts we have to logically actually deduce some of the logically equivalent permutations of such a query, we end up specifically in this example, we end up with a, with a query that effectively leads to a three to the power of three times of the, the number of combinations that we have to write in order to write that query path. So the, 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 the number of permutations becomes extremely high and your query becomes verbose. So, and, and then when on the analytical side, when we think of things like, you know, which movies are actors are in the same cluster, we've got a, some sort of a movie domain 
we may want to use something like a practical algorithm, a connected component algorithm that may find us these actors in, uh, in, in these movies. And the reference implementation in Java is, is easy, over 200 lines of code in, um, in, in Java. And so the point we're trying to make here is that these types of BSP type of algorithms are very hard to reuse, especially because we can't actually use them across our data sets. So, but then why is it that we can't handle complexity with current databases? And now these are subjects of other talks and I'm, I am admittedly going quite fast through these materials. So I, I, hope, I hope it's still followable. Um, you're able to follow, but when we think of SQL, we think of a model that's too low level. You're, you're working at third normal form. You're killed by joins, especially if you're doing more complex traversal type queries. If you think about NoSQL as a general and, and graph databases in general, you're also facing the fact that there's no schema constraint and you're also working with a very low level data model. And then for those familiar with the semantic web, RDF and Owl specifically, similar problems come, come as well. You're also working with a very low level uh, data model in triples. And also it's generally built for, it's just built for the open world, although there's a lot of different implementations. Uh, but the inherent complexity in there is, is tremendous. So, you know, when we look at the world and we see database systems and database languages specifically, we've, they're too low level to really handle that complexity. So, now this slide is a bit, I hope this is um, self-explanatory, but obviously we, we built Graken around it. And so Graken uh, being the knowledge representation system and Grackle as the language or the, the language to query and to reason and to uh, model and, and, and we'll go over that in the, in the next couple of slides. Um, for those interested, Grackle, Grackle as a language is a fifth generation language. And we, we talk about a fifth generation language that is able to declare logic and constraints to the computer instead of instructing algorithms. So to, um, to introduce to you the model that kind of founds, kind of, it, it forms the basis of the entire language uh, is this. So this is the knowledge model. And we say that a knowledge model needs to be able to represent type hierarchies, hyper relations, and rules. So everything in Graken fits this model. And we say there's nothing you cannot model using this. In fact, this is actually direct implementation of the, of the enhanced entity relationship model uh, for those familiar. And specifically means a concept level schema specifically. So you're not working with graphs, you're not working with triples, you're not working with tables, you're working with entities that can subtype each other, you're working with attributes that are, can also subtype each other. You're working with relations that can also subtype each other. And finally, roles are the construct that, that creates the context of what a thing plays a role in a relation. So even a relation can play a role in another relation, but so can an attribute and an entity. And then we've got the concept of a rule, which we'll come to in a second, but that allows us to effectively reason over our data and represent logical statements to create new facts in the, in the database. Um, at this point, I, I'd I always like to check if there's any, any questions. Um, oh, uh, uh, sorry. Any, any questions so far? Um, if, if so, I'm, I'm happy to, to pause for a second. If not, then we will continue. So I'll do, I'll do a quick demo now. So this is what, I, what, what I'm gonna be showing now. This is our, our visualization software, which is called Workbase. A Workbase is effectively your IDE to work with your data um, in, with Graken. It's, it's not an end user application. It's, it's really meant for, um, for developers and for development teams to look at what data is in Graken. And, and right now, um, there's a Graken instance running on my computer. There's some data in there. Um, I, re I already ran the query. That's why you see these, um, the, the, these this, this data here, but basically the underlying data set contains data from risk uh, exposure between organizations as financial in the financial domain. There are ownership structures, exposures, different assets that are owned by different entities. And the question we're trying to ask at a high level, so let's say the business, what the business wants to know is give me any bank that's exposed to a, to a high risk score. Now, so the way we write that in, in Grackle, so this is our language. So we say match because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a query. We're fetching data. So this is like a select query in, uh, in SQL. 
We're saying dollar $B is a bank. So the, the, the dollar sign here denotes the variable name. So I can call this dollar $B or dollar $BE or, or even bank. But this is, oh, this is simply a variable name. Then we say dollar risk is a risk score as risk level high. So basically we're saying, give me a, an entity type called risk score that has an attribute type called risk level with the value high. And this is a string, as you can tell. And then what we say is we connect the bank we say $B plays the role of risk subject and the risk score plays the role of risk value inside of a risk exposure relation. So that's the query we write. And this is the answer we get. So we see, first of all, we see that there's two banks, uh, Gwalian Securities and RBS that, that are um, returned that are exposed to these three risk scores. Now, this is already where we see some of the automated reasoning taking, uh, taking place because we ask for a risk score but we were returned a civil unrest, a war score, and a cybercrime score. So those are subtypes of their parent, and their parent in this case is risk score. Second, why were these created? What's behind these four relations? Because actual, the actual underlying data doesn't have any relation between any bank and any risk score. So these four, these are what we call inferred relations. So they're not persistent. They were computed on the fly just when we asked the question, and we can also see that their base step is inferred relation. Hence it being uh, inferred and not persisted. What that means is that we can actually dig deeper. So why were they created? So if I look at this relation and I press explain, I can do this programmatically through the API as well. If, you're, if you're, you know, wanna build your own visualizer on top of Kraken, that's possible as well. But here we see that actually Qualian has this energy asset called Akata. And Akata seems to be in this jurisdiction called um, uh, in, in Jakarta. So Akata oil field is, is in this jurisdiction, Jakarta, which is connected to that civil and risk score. And so effectively we're saying that, okay, you know, there's a bank with a risky asset because it's in a risky jurisdiction. Now, if we look at this one here, now why is RBS connected to that cybercrime score? So if I press explain, I see that actually under the hood, there's, a, there's an attack campaign called TPF 294, which is some cyber attack which is connected obviously to that cybercrime score. But this relation is interested, interesting because now this is a persistent relation. We see that again, it says just, it, it just says relation as its base type. However, this one actually is also, is, is inferred as well. So we're dealing here with an inference in an inference. So if I press explain on this relation, I see that the actual um, explanation shows us that it's not actually RBS itself as an entity, as a legal entity under attack. It's this real estate corporate called Posti Kintestot that is under attack. And it gets a bit more interesting because actually Posti Kintestot isn't directly owned by RBS. In fact, it's a subsidiary of another subsidiary of RBS. In this case, a company called Nordisk Renting. And finally, when we look at um, these two, these two here, these two banks, why are they connected to the same war score? Now, th th that would be very coincidental, unless we dig deeper and see, you know, why, what about this relation? So if I press explain here, I see that actually the underlying, the underlying data shows us that there's a, there's a bond that is issued by this jurisdiction, Lagos, which is connected to that war score. But the, 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 the more, um, um, the more fundamentally interesting um, part of this particular example is that when we look at this particular bond here, the, the, its, its relation to RBS isn't, uh, isn't directly, um, isn't direct. So they don't own it directly. So because we're pressing play on this relation, I see that actually there's a joint venture between Gwalian and RBS, and bear in mind, this is what we call a ternary relation. So there's a three-way relation. This is an example of a hyper relation. And we see that there's a connection between this bond and Huawei securities. Now, so, so, so there's this joint venture between these two banks that seems to have this exposure to that bond. But this is where it gets even more interesting because that exposure is isn't, 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 isn't not fairly direct either because actually there's a board of directors sitting on Huawei securities and one member on that board of directors is a man named Sheng Chao. And Sheng Chao is married to a woman named Anna McDonald. And Anna McDonald, she seems to have this, an exposure to that bond. However, 
and this is where we get to the end of it, um, she doesn't actually personally own the bond because it actually goes through a special purpose vehicle. And this is the, the final inference that I show because she's actually a director on this SPV that is the actual ultimate beneficiary of that bond. So it's a, it's a fairly long winded kind of story here, but what we're trying to say is that the, the, the higher level query that we're trying to ask actually gives us a very simple answer. It's just RBS and volume. That, that's the answer to the question. So if you're building an application that needs to know this answer because you're customer or your user needs to know this is what you care about. But under but what Graken takes care of as the underlying complexity is are all these relations. And so and, and, and I mean specifically this is this is the task of what a what a reasoning engine does. And so you know practically speaking we, we see a lot of people trying to build this in their application layers, but it's a it's a very complex endeavor to to do that. And so that's where you want to leverage some some an actual or an actual reasoning engine. Uh, like Graken that does it natively within the database language. Um, are there any questions uh, so far? I had, a, I had a question, Thomas. Actually, do the Hi. do the relation? So the relations. Um, mm -hmm. I assume they are directional. So, as in, you you have one relation encoding one way from one entity to another and then a different relation definition vice on the way back? Or do you have, so for example, between the man and the woman, is it just marriage is the relation or is there like is husband of and is wife of? Good question. So that's, that's what we mean by um, this being a higher level data model because when you are working in something like a triple, let's say, and you are encoding something like has marriage, that there is inherent directionality in there. But that's a very limited data model when you're trying to express higher level constructs because, you know, has husband, has parents, let's say has wife, means that the other person has, uh, has, has husband, right? But instead, what we want to be able to represent is something that, that represents that whole native, that whole relationship between those two entities. So there's no directionality, even though perhaps the arrows may be slightly misleading, so maybe the UI isn't perfect here. But, um, but yes, you're right, this relation is called marriage, but there's only two role, there's two role players in that relation. So there's a husband and there's a wife that are, that are connected to, these, to this man and this woman. So there's no directionality. And then, so to, um, to continue on the slides, because this will answer some, possibly some follow-up questions. So, if we look at the actual model on how we how we were to model this domain so to start off with a very simple basic model now what you see on the right is the is the is the modeling language which is also in grapple here we're defining a person a company and employment and a name so a person is a is an entity and we define that simply by saying person sub entity we're saying that the person has a, an attribute called name which we say through saying person has name. And the person plays the role of employee. So here we say person plays, plays employee because if we look below, we see that employment is a relation that relates to these two role players, employee and employer, because the company plays the role of employer in that relation. And lastly, we define the attribute as simply a subtype of an attribute with its data type. And on the left, you see the visual representation and uh, we denote relations as diamonds, attributes as circles, and entities as squares. Now let's say we extend the model and we say that there's also startups and there's customers. So we say that a person uh, or a customer is a subtype of a person that has a specific rating. Now this customer will now inherit all the properties, the roles, the attributes that a parent has. And here we also, we have a startup that is also a sub company that inherits that effectively becomes a subtype of a company. And so the question is, could a, can a startup employ customer? And the answer is yes, because again, they, uh, they inherit those properties and, and that's where the, the uh, type inheritance comes into play. Now let's say we extend the model and we create a, a, a marriage relation, let's say, um, um, there's there maybe a wife, a husband, if we're talking about you know, old school marriages. Um, 
and we want to now create um, a, a insert data. So to insert that, the, 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 the syntax is the same as the way how you would uh, how you would query for data. So we would say dollar a again. This is a variable name. Is a company with the name IBM. Then there's also a person that has the name Alice, and we want to connect dollar a and dollar b in an employment relation. So here we say IBM is employing Alice. And then we also want to say startup employs customer. And remember, we haven't explicitly declared this in the, in the schema, but because of their parents, they can actually employ each other or a customer can employ startup, sorry, startup can employ customer. Uh, and finally, we, can we marry a, a person with a customer? And the answer is yes, because of the, again, the inheritance here. And then we say commit. And, um, and, and, and so, and that would succeed because it adheres to the schema. But let's say we want to, let's say we want to marry a person to a company. Um, that's not possible, although I think many of us do. Uh, it, may, it may feel like we do sometimes. Um, but in this case, a person cannot marry a company. So this would fail. And, and that's something that we, we, we are quite, um, quite uh, adamant about is that we, we introduce schema constraints back or, you know, back. So we, we do maintain logical integrity of your data at the database level. So it's, it doesn't have to be implicit somewhere in your application layer, for example. So to give some examples of how you would model some of the relations that I mentioned before, and I, I won't go into too much detail, but just to show you how you go about modeling these things um, to give you an idea. If we have a reflexive relation, so we have Alice teaches herself, we simply have two different role players played by the same person dollar x in a teacher's relation. We can have a symmetric relation where we've got two different people playing the same role in a marriage. So Alice plays the role of spouse, Bob plays the role of spouse in a marriage relation. Then we have ternary relations where we've got three role players. So we can say a movie, a person and a company are all in one relation. And, and, and by the way, this is where, especially um, you know, if you're using something like a triple you can't do that unless you reify your data. And reifying your data, although technically possible, introduces a lot of complexities by virtue of going through that reification process. So we want to be able to natively represent higher order relations. And that's where the hypergraph is so useful because the hypergraph effectively creates, uh, creates a set of vertices. And so we've got, in this case, three entities playing a role in one relation where, with, with different role players each. But we can go even further. We can say that there's mo even more relations, more role players in one relation, as long as it adheres to the schema, by the way. It needs to be declared first in the schema. So here we've got uh, a relation that's called joint venture. So this relates to the demo that I just gave, where we've got one, two, three, five, five companies where four own one joint venture, which, is play which plays the role of owned. And then we can go even, even more interesting where we've got a relation in another relation. And, and this is really what, what uh, uh, this is you know, one, one of the um, key ex prime examples of having a hypergraph where uh, a, a relation becomes a first class citizen of, this, of the system. So if we have two persons marrying each other in a marriage relation, we can attach this variable M to this relation. And what we, now can, what we can do now is we can say there's a city, there's London, we can literally put that dollar M in this other, in this tuple. And now we can literally create a relation because between an entity and a relation. I mean, I, I think that's really cool. Um, and so effectively, um, you know, to, and to give you another example of where this is applicable that we see a lot, especially in the life sciences, if you've got a protein interaction between two proteins, that interaction itself is a relation. Let's say you want to localize that, that, that particular interaction with a tissue. You want to create that relation between that tissue, that interaction, that protein interaction with that tissue, which will, 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 would be an entity. And then we have tr transitive relations. And this is, where, um, this is where we're introducing the notion of rules. So let's say you've got a, you want to say that if London is in the UK and if the UK is in Europe, not the U, that's, that's not lo longer so, um, then London is also located in, in, in Europe. And this, this transitivity, we could express by writing a rule. And so we would name the rule by subtyping it as a rule. We define the set of propositions that we want to 
have as conditions. So here we say that if X is connected to Y, and if Y is connected to Z, then we want to connect X to Z. And for, for those familiar with, with horn clauses, these are effectively horn clauses that you're able to, you, you can write. And then we've got the notion of an equivalent relation. So where we want to say that if the same parent has two different children, we can now infer that actually those children should be siblings. And we can do that, uh, which would look like this. And to go back to the previous example of this reasoning query, where we want to be able to retrieve explicitly stored data, but also implicitly derived information. So to write this query, if we have a model that allows us to query for any organization, we would be able to infer all those three subtypes. If we query for every premise, which would infer all these premises, and we query for the country UK, then we simply say, give me any connection between organization and premise. So we just simply create the super and an owns relation. And then we just simply say, premise is connected to the UK, but because of the transitivity rule that we would have created, it would basically infer all the locations in the UK. And finally, this is an example of especially that is you know, still a fairly low level uh, or kind of simple example. Uh, but going back to the earlier SQL query that I, that I showed, the reason why you would want to use something like Kraken is because you can literally, the, the query on the left in Kraken would look like the query on the right. And it's not, there's no magic in here. It's, it's just simply pushing down code, specifically logic in the form of, of leveraging the automated reasoning capabilities in Kraken while also having a more expressive model allows us to, when we're then querying for that higher level, in this case, uh, give me a drug that's connected to, to asthma through a drug disease relation, we're able to simply ask a question in a much simpler way because for a lot of people, it will be very difficult to write um, SQL code um, like this. And that's not to bash SQL because I, I, I don't like that, but uh, that's just to say there's different use cases or different things. And finally, something I haven't spoken at all about really today, um, but it's, that's the analytical side of Kraken. So everything that I've really touched upon is more on the o OLTP side, but on the OLAP part, if we have something like a connected component algorithms, we can actually write that as a function in the language. So you would say compute cluster in these types using this algorithm. And we have not, not one, but several of these algorithms, including K-Core, Centrality, Connected Components, uh, and some other compute algorithms as well. Now, this is still a fairly experimental part of Kraken. It's less mature than the OLTP part, I should add. So kind of to summarize um, um, the, the, what I've spoken about or what Kraken is, so we, we implement the knowledge schema, so a concept level schema that, in, that is based on hypergraph theory that is extensible at any point in time. Uh, it, it implements a type system and there's an automated reasoning engine that, that takes that model and does automated reasoning in real time. Specifically, it does backward chaining, if anyone's familiar with that. And it's implemented through rule-based reasoning and type-based reasoning. All of this is done in real time when you're querying for it. It's not pre-computed beforehand. We've got the OLAP part is distributed analytics, the, the, the functions, um, the analytics as a language, as we say. But all of that, all of these different kind of technology pieces, it's really important for us that we offer a language that, um, you know, to, to, that, that people can really fall in love with because that's, that's what we want people to do. Because there is something beautiful about having a technology that can, can, can work for one's use case. And so we do our best and we've, you know, we dedicate our lives to making the language as simple to use, but, but expressive enough that it allows you to build technologies or that work with very complex data. And, and we, we had actually our first conference in, uh, of our open source community back in February, just before the lockdown happened, which was just pure coincidence in terms of timing. Um, and that was great. We had a couple of hundred people fly over from all over the world. We have, I think, 35, 40 speakers. Um, so if you're interested, just, Go on, Google, go on YouTube and you'll find most of the talks are online uh, to see what people are doing. Um, I guess uh, um, there's some other slides. I won't go through all of them given because of the time, but I always like to just share some of the logos that we see uh, from our conference that attended. Um, the type of use cases that we see are from a lot of the life sciences, the financial sector, uh, cybersecurity as well with some government agencies. 
massive data management, NLP, machine learning stuff. It, it's very broad, even robotics. So um, yeah, at this point, I'm very happy to see if there's any questions at all. And if whatever I said was, uh, was of interest to anyone. Oh, we have a lot of, uh... okay. Thank you, Thomas, um, for the great presentation and the demo. Uh, I'll open up to questions now from everyone. Okay, um, I've got a question. I mean, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's been interesting to see kind of all the theory and how you put it all together and how it works. Um, do you have any examples of like organizations that have been applying it and sort of the, the results that they've been seeing? Yeah, just if you go on YouTube, just Google for Bracken. And if you go on our YouTube channel, you'll find 30 or 40 talks from people using Bracken. Okay. Um, so how, how they're using it in, for NLP, for, for life sciences, for, um, yeah, that, 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 that's the kind of most accessible way. Alternatively, I also encourage you to just join our Discord channel and see what people are building. Um, and uh, we try to be as transparent as possible. Are there any specific examples that you'd highlight sort of now as sort of interesting ones to look at? Oh, there's so many, but um, I mean, I, I love one particular project, I guess, just to, in the interest of sharing. And I, I share this one because it is open source. So a lot of it, what they're doing is, is tremendous work. Um, so the, so the, I don't know if anyone's French here, but the, the, there's an, a government agency called uh, ANSI, which is like the, I think it's like the sort of the CIA of, of France, uh, but they deal with cybersecurity of the country and their ex head of cyber threat intelligence started a project that is still, it's still growing and he, he just switched jobs right before, but it's basically an open CTI platform that effectively um, allows you to visualize and store cyber threat intelligence um, threat uh, threats and, and they're open source as well. That's why I'm particularly excited by them. They, and, and we work very closely together to help each other out. Um, but their, their stuff is really cool because uh, it's got a great UI and it's, it's open source. So if you're interested to see how they um, used it and because a lot of their, you know, they're using, for example, GraphQL. So if you want to know how they're using GraphQL with Graken, you can look at their code and see if it can be inspired. In fact, there's other people that are trying to repurpose what they've done for, for cancer research and other stuff. And, um, and I just think it's just really, really cool that they've been able to build a community on top of us. They actually started using MongoDB, then switched to Neo4j, and finally they settled on, uh, on Graken after we did our first kind of meetup in Paris in, um, I think at the end of 2018, it's been a while now. And um, yeah, I, th I love that one. And there's some other great ones like uh, Bro robots, like spy drones, like underwater drones with Graken, the whole object relative objectiveness of, of objects uh, represented that in Graken um, and the performance and, and also the, 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 the actual individual monitors within a device, um, monitoring how a robot should do a task uh, if it's got only two sensors working out of three, um, I can go on like this for a while, but I, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Nice, thank you. I have a, I've got a quick question. <clears throat> You've just mentioned there that um, example of a, um, a team who moved from Neo4j. Uh, Neo4j, I would say, is probably the, the kind of... Uh, the most popular graph database. And I'm interested to know how you compare Graken to that. Would you would you kind of put yourself in a different class or would you think, you know, actually there's some direct comparisons to make? How do you how do you think about that comparison? Yeah. So it's um in a way it's it's like comparing C to Python. So we we leveraged a hypergraph data model under the hood to do what we do. But literally Graken is, is an abstraction over if you may wish to call it a graph database. Um, and so it, it's almost comparing, it's almost like comparing apples to oranges. So while yes, we do get compared a lot with Neo4j simply because it's another database, but also, but similarly, you know, to Oracle, to MongoDB, anything that is a persistent store. Specifically to Neo4j, if I have to be very sim simplistic in it, um, there's the, the, the graph model is a, pro, is a property graph model that is implemented in, in Neo and, and some of the other, um, some of our other friends as well there. So that property graph model is just a binary directional relation between two, between two things. Now, in our opinion, it's extremely, extremely low level and extremely limiting in, in representing complex relations. So to us, instead, you know, we, you know, you don't have to know any graph theory. 
just work at the conceptual model. So just, just go conceptual ER diagram modeling. That's your model. We use under the hood hypergraph theory to do what we do, but you don't need to know hypergraph theory. So we try to make it as simple as possible for most developers. And then second, which is what, which is really where kind of the distinction is also made, is, is there's, there's an inbuilt reasoning engine in Graken. And, and that doesn't, that's not what a graph database is about. A graph database is just about representing your data in a graphical format, whether it's triples or in a property graph. There, that's not about reasoning. And so that's why we effectively are an abstraction layer over um, a graph model. And so I hope that, that, that clears up. I mean, there's more, obviously, more nuances. And, and um, yeah. No, it does. And uh, I mean, I guess part of it, too, that I wonder about is just even whether whether you see that positioning as as a challenge as you address the market or whether actually people kind of get that distinction pretty clearly. So, you know, with respect to what they you know, they've done a great job of building a community. Um, I, I must admit, we, there's a lot of people switching right now. Um, from from those models to 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 Graken, um, and then simply it's because it's just a more richer model, um, mm -hmm. and 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 that's why we build it because we didn't find any of the solutions to be acceptable, especially to the wider community. Because although graph databases are seem to be the hype these days, uh, it's it's a it's still it's still a very niche place. It's hard to hire good developers that can build yeah. you good models, and and that's something that we face, and that's why we decided not to follow any of the standards. So, you know, to be perfectly frank, we do get quite a bit of slack from some of the more graph traditionalists that, you know, you have to follow the standards. Um, but we think that one of the key reasons why it hasn't really taken off is because a lot of complexity inherent, just, you know, you know, if you're a technical leader building a team and you need someone with very specialized skills, it's quite hard to then form, to actually build a team around there. And so when we set out to build our language or just whenever you build it, language in general, there's this balance between how expressive do you make it and how simple or complex is it. So you can make it something super, super expressive, but then you can make it, it's very easy to make it super complex because developers love to make, you know, class namings very complex. But the truth is, you know, that will limit the way the world adopts you. And, and, and so we, we've spent a lot of love and a lot of sweat and tears and, and discussions to, you know, even the keyword as simple as has, if we can make it fewer key, fewer characters than just three we would because that that's that's how important it is for us that even biologists can read the model and, and that's what we're seeing today mm. and and that's 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 really important to us because that 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 enables innovation that enables as i started before that that enables us as a humanity to you know to progress and i think that's a worth life live a life worth living there's there's probably a uh danger if you go too far with too, being too succinct there's a, um, a column or in database that i worked with before called kdb and um yes. they they take yeah. they took that to the extreme where it was so um was so much so much focus on brevity that you could you could barely un understand unless you spent all day every day working with kdb and kdb plus yeah i do have but that's what it's about i do have um uh, a slightly different question. Again, mm -hmm. similar to though about how you kind of position yourself in the market and how people ask around that positioning. Does performance become uh, is performance something that that people talk about when when trying to choose different solutions? Is it something that that you you pay attention to as well? So the way we build Graken, and I'll go back to the slides now to uh, this one part I didn't show. So when we set up to build Kraken, and, and yes, we decided to build something very different to, to everyone else. And there's obviously inherent risk in there. To us, there isn't a risk because you know, we're convinced that you know, either we're crazy or not. There's a fine balance between genius and crazy, right? So um, the, um, we started building out the schema language. We, we uh, built the, the language to write queries. Uh, we, we then spent a lot of time building the reasoning engine. In the in to do all that reasoning, there's a lot of math involved. It's, it's, it looks sometimes really simple, <laughs> but it's it's really it's not. Um, we we spent an, a lot of time building a distributed server and, and especially multi language clients. We've also spent an inordinate amount of time to building a build system that, I, that I'm honestly so proud about. Um, and you'll you'll find in, especially if you look for Gravel, which is our internal multi repo build test release automation system, 
that we may actually release open source uh, or, or maybe commercially as well. We haven't decided, but it, allow, it allows us to, for someone to, to make a PR and if immediately know what does this mean for correctness, for testing, for performance and all of that. And that's important because right now uh, we're releasing Racken 2.0 .0 this summer. Um, so all of this is, is, has had performance obviously in the back of our minds, but it's always been kind of a final step. Once we've got the behavior right, the community behind us, we can react to Greg. And so, you know, under the hood to, to share that a bit as well. So we've had as our persistent layer, Cassandra and Janus graph on top of that, which is a property graph. Hmm. We've, you know, this is a, it's an open secret by now, but um, we've, we've deleted Janus graph and we build our own hypergraph database. Um, and we've replaced Cassandra with RocksDB. And uh, I don't want to make any, any promises, but we're, we're expecting immense performance improvements for um, 2.0 because uh, you know, I, I, right now Graken is, is not the most performing database because we've never done the effort to make it that way. But yes, that's right now what we're working on and that's kind of our roadmap. Uh, and after that, we'll focus on the analytical side as well. But yes, performance is absolutely critical um, because well, because you gotta, you gotta be able to run queries on time. Mm. Cool, thanks. That's not to say Graken is, is super slow, by the way, and unworkable. It's still being used in production and you can you still use it, but for some of our more bigger deployments with you know, petabytes of data um, or, or real-time kind of chatbots with thousand concurrent users, um, and especially with complex reasoning queries, that's kind of where you know, the spectrum Um, I have a question um, about yeah. um, uh, your sources. So, I mean, obviously this is an abstraction, but um, I guess one issue with knowledge systems these days is misinformation, right? So um, um, kind of this misinformation channels when you deduce one fact from a wrong source and then that kind of just gets propagated. Is there any mechanism um, uh, in Graken that um, kind of vets sources in some way and prevents precludes misinformation or evaluates the quality of the sources or is that entirely a distinct component? Graken, Graken as a system is, is inherently deterministic. So whatever misinformation is represented will, will represent that misinformation. So the reason I'm saying that is because as, as a system itself, Graken is just a, the knowledge representation system for you to encode whatever knowledge domain you're trying to model. And so if you are working with misinformation, which is actually something we are seeing in a couple of use cases for example, in the pharmaceutical space where especially there's misinformation in or contradictions in papers. So if you have one paper claiming that, you know, drug A inhibits protein B, which then should activate some other protein. But if someone, another one says something, um, you know, contradictory to that, you could simply build a rule that finds those contradictions. And so it would be per use case dependent and per uh, domain of that misinformation of what, what that exactly means. Um, Kraken would be the, the system to represent that misinformation as well in a deterministic way. Okay. And, and to that, before I forget, I wanna also make sure that uh, I clarify some other things. So when you use Kraken, we also have a, um, uh, or you know, thinking architecturally, uh, Kraken really serves as the knowledge base. So all of the, you know, knowledge acquisition. I know deep dive isn't around anymore, but you know NLP stuff and, and machine learning. Uh, we, we actually have a library to connect to TensorFlow. It's called uh, the whole library is called KGLib, um, and specifically the project that is most popular right now is called KGCN, which stands for Knowledge Graph Convolution Networks, which I believe it's uh, adapted from a, a, a graph stage from DeepMind and then applied to a graph. And so you, you, you push a subgraph into TensorFlow and then it learns over your reason data. So you, have, you can do link prediction um, effectively with, with over reason data, which, which is incredibly promising. And um, you'll find that also a channel, all, all of that is open source if you Google for KGCN or KGLib. Are there any use cases people are working on that they'd like to consider Graken for? Because one of the things we like to do is really show how Graken is useful other than just me, you know, talking to you. <laughs> I find it a bit tiring sometimes. <laughs> and if, if not, you know, please send me, feel free to send me an email in private as well. I'm, I'm on Twitter or LinkedIn or Discord. Um, and I, I do try to respond within a day. I guess on that, um, Thomas, maybe a question. Um, for myself, as I'm not too familiar with um, graph databases and knowledge representations, it might be mm -hmm. hard for me sometimes to look at the use cases that I'm working on and understand whether 
such a database type would be appropriate for the things I'm trying to do. I don't know if over the years that you've been working on this, whether you have certain tips or things you look out for um, to say, actually, that makes a lot of sense um, to yeah. use this type of database uh, or representation for. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the graph database aspect is irrelevant. It's more, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to build? And, and what, how does your data look like? And then, you know, we look at, you know, what, what's the best uh, database you should use? Um, if your use case is, let's say, a real time time series, heavy, late, you know, very low latency data, then there's other solutions you should use because Kraken isn't optimized for, you know, time series type, type of IoT type of data. Um, Kraken is shines when you're working with complex or just even slightly less complex, but just data that has a lot of relation between them. Um, so it really depends per use case. That's why we like to hear about people's problems. What are they building? And especially if they're still deciding on what's, what sort of database they want to use as their underlying uh, storage. And sometimes people have multiple databases, but that's uh, it's down to their architectural choices. And the, I wanted to ask a question before as well around uh, mm -hmm. when you were going through your presentation, it kind of reminded me of um, the start of AI as a field where it was much more about symbolic AI and encoding you know, human knowledge yeah. into these systems. And then we've moved heavily into non-symbolic where now you're yeah. just learning everything from data. And I think, I think we move into extremes and the pendulum swings, but there's something <laughs> like in between, right? And I wonder yeah. what's your view on um, how we can marry this sort of symbolic and non-symbolic AI to, to yeah. use leverage the powers of both. Yeah, well, first of all, it's really down to tooling because if you don't have good tooling that can do some symbolic AI well, no one's going to use it. You know, no one, no one really knows about Prolog, you know, or data log. Who knows about these languages? They've existed for a while, but so the tooling around to do these types of technologies inhibits a lot the adoption. So what we found, especially with Graken, is that the, the, the simplicity of the language allows people to not even have to know about symbolic AI because the theory, the theory is secondary to the problem you're trying to solve in, you know, in very crude terms. So, and I always like to refer to specifically what someone else said, this big telecommunications giant, and they've got hundreds of machine learning agents that do very specific tasks. There's no context between those agents because they're very narrow focus on you know, the tasks they have to perform. And, and they are, you know, the, like other enterprises, surprisingly, they are focusing what's their, what's their knowledge base that even decides which agents to use based on a reasoning system. And so it's really about that division of responsibility. What are deterministic tasks that need to be encoded? What are machine learning tasks? And are, do we have the right tooling that allow us to build software that basically does that translation? Um, to give, you know, one last example, uh, there's one robotics team in the Netherlands, they're building these robots with Graken, and they do a lot of machine learning to, you know, the whole computer vision stuff, but they've really struggled to do the representational stuff because a lot of these technologies, and I'm specifically referring to the semantic web, is too complex. It's just really complex. And so they have these silos within these organizations that can't really talk to each other. And Graken has enabled them to break that silo down and be able to work more closely, simply because if you're on the machine learning side, most people are not going to know, you know, what OWL is or OWL DL or, you know, all the different families uh, within description, description logic. So it's really the human element, I think, um, that's down to the tooling and understanding that those divisions of responsibility um, when we think architecturally of a problem. Cool. Hi. Um, Hi. So I, I was wondering, if, I'm, if I have something and it's, it's in a relational database, mm -hmm. at which point would I start sort of thinking maybe this is more adapted to a graph database? Or, and sort of to piggyback on that, like what's something that graph databases would not be good at? So, like, at? so there's a lot of things graph databases aren't good at, and that's why we build Graken. Uh, Graken is, is not a graph database in that sense. Um, the first question, if you, so I, I also, I gave a talk um, at our conference specifically comparing SQL to Kraken. So if you're interested to, uh, to you know, if, you, if you're gonna have lunch later today or tomorrow, um, I would suggest maybe watch that video. Um, it's about 35 minutes long, I think. And 
but that shows you specifically that when we model things in at a conceptual model, which is much richer in how we how we how we model just the the, the, the semantics in there versus forcing some tabular format on top of that, that means we lose semantics in our data, and especially in, in in domains where you need to be able to query across quite a few different connections, that becomes quite difficult. Um, to, to answer your, your question in, in one sentence, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult because it's, it's just, a, just a lot of different use cases. Um, the, the other one is also when you need some sort of automated reasoning engine that does reason for you. All right. Um, the, um, the, that's where you need a reasoning engine and that's just simply what a graph database cannot do. That's what a relational databases cannot do. Um, and that's why we build Graken, which in a, in a nutshell has a conceptual level schema based on hypergraph theory that, that also implements an automated reasoning engine on top of that and all of that within one product. Th does that help a little bit, Lucas? I'd love to understand better your use case to, to answer your question better. No, it's more like I'm not, I'm, I'm also not very familiar with, uh, with, with the knowledge graph. And, and I was just thinking like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm my first point of, of contact when I'm mm -hmm. trying out something, especially if it has relations, I would jump into like Postgres, right? Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if, at which point should I, if, if there's like some kind of key things I should be, I should start thinking maybe this isn't, Postgres isn't the best mm -hmm. for this. Maybe I should just try out. Yeah. And, and I think you mentioned something like, you know, doing, doing some kind of inferences uh, or reasoning. So I guess that's what well, that's one. If, if I had to give a very simple answer, if you, if you see that you have a lot of entity types and a lot of relation types, that becomes difficult in a relational database. Okay, cool. Well, I think we've, I think we've run out of time, Thomas, but thank you so much for the talk today. And I guess um, if you don't mind, I'll share all the resources that you mentioned and, and your email, I think. Um, yes. uh, I encourage everyone, if they can think of use cases, to get back to Thomas as well. I'm sure he'd love to hear uh, what you all come up with. Um, but thanks everyone for tuning in as well. And uh, we'll be in touch for the next session. Amazing. Thank you, Gerard, for inviting me. Thank you everyone for staying until the end. I hope to see you, uh, I hope to speak again at some point. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.